So, uh, life's terrible. <sighs> Most of you know that. But I will reiterate it. I uh, had to move out of Tacoma, Washington to get a job, which was a major pain in my ass. But I wanted to share more stories with all of you lovely people now that I'm beginning to have a stable life again. I hope some of you guys remember me. It's been a very long time since I posted. Regardless, um, here we go. So let me tell you a story from my childhood. Um, even with a strange town like mine, I have many moments of nostalgia from my earlier years. I often fondly look back at my elementary school and middle school years. And hell, anything before I was due to go off to college was a very fond memory. So all you adults out there can probably testify. God, how I wish I could go back to those simpler days. Now, this is one of the few stories from my childhood that I do not recall all that often. Um, and when I do, it sure as hell isn't out of fondness. Let me tell you about the Sunny Friends Daycare. My father didn't retire until two years ago. He worked many years as an architect in an architecture firm in the nearby city. His days were long and mostly uneventful, but he made some insane money off his job. So my mother was a special education teacher at the local middle school until she got a much better job offer to work as a financial aid officer at a large university about an hour or so away. The only catch was that she'd be working basically all year round and she'd have to go to the office on campus. But this is back in the summer between 5th and 6th grade, so I wasn't really old enough to be taking care of myself, you know, home alone for about 9 hours a day. So both my parents realized this and that's when they reached out to the Sunny Friends Daycare. Now one of the moms my mom hung out with all the time sent her kids, Riley and Carrie, whom I talked to somewhat regularly for a long time, over to the daycare, and they loved it. And my mom probably looked into it for about two full minutes and just signed me up. To be fair, my mother, um, well, she didn't normally do this. She pulled an all-nighter once, making sure that the summer camp I went to after completing sixth grade would be safe and enjoyable. It wasn't even out of fear that Jason Voorhees haunted that camp or anything, it's just being motherly. Well, my mom sat me down one Saturday and explained that she was starting a new job and that I would be going to Sunny Friends Daycare during the week for most of the summer. I put up a bit of a fuss, but then I accepted it. That Monday, we arrived at the daycare and my mom kissed me before she ushered me out of the car. Upon stepping out, I saw there were some kids I recognized there. Caden Nowitzki and Rachel Dunn, and of course, Riley and Carrie were already there. Riley spotted me and asked if I wanted to come play with the action figures in the big playroom. I quickly felt myself liking the daycare and soaking up the experience like nobody's business. After the first week, we had managed to make a friend circle. It was comprised of Riley, Carrie, Rachel, Caden, Ivan, Bird, and Eden Duquette. We invented a secret language and secret hand symbols and did everything that ten-year-olds would do together. For the most part, we were the oldest kids there, so not many of the other kids wanted to be friends with us. Connie Winston was almost 12, but she liked to pretend like she was an adult and basically ignored all of us children. She's a prostitute now in New Orleans, and makes about twice my annual salary in a month. Either way, I was quickly looking forward to daycare every day and always wanted to bring whatever toys I could. I brought my Nintendo DS, and we would all play Mario Kart together in the corner. Rachel usually screamed like a banshee when she lost. Having heard a banshee twice in my life, I can say that Rachel had an obnoxiously loud scream and got us in trouble. Other than that, we were usually the saints of the daycare. We took care of ourselves, cleaned up after ourselves, didn't go out of our way to destroy the place, and we knew how to use the bathroom. We became employee favorites, and Becca Thompson would always bring us Snicker bars and Fridays to show her appreciation for being mostly in control of ourselves and potty trained. Miles Vandermeer was seven years old and still wearing diapers because he was too afraid to, well, shit in an actual toilet. If I remember correctly, it remained that way until eighth grade for him. Again, we were the saints of the daycare. I remember the day Rachel beat me in a race in Rainbow Road and I knocked over this massive box of miscellaneous crayons out of pure childish anger. And that was the only time I remember Becca, or anyone at the daycare for that matter, being angry with me. I don't even remember getting a bad placement. I think I finished third and I was just... I was just mad that Rachel managed to beat me. Now, I'll get to the strange and horrific nature of the story. Otherwise, why would I be telling you about this daycare? 
No, no one would want to listen to something like that. Not here, at least. In the summer of 2008, our town was seeing more tourism than usual. If you could even call people passing through to get to the state park tourism. We also had about 10 different families move into a new suburban sprawl by the apartment building. Compared to 2006 or 2007, we were flush with money and we had no idea what to do with it. The board considered putting it into a YMCA center in the north end of town, but that fell through. I'm not positive this is why that happened, but I feel like it certainly has something to do with it. On August 7th, my mom dropped me off at daycare as per usual. I ran inside and cheerfully greeted Riley and Carrie, who were sitting out in our little corner of the room, ready to play some Mario Kart. We played a bunch of games that summer, but always kept coming back to Mario Kart. Rachel and Eden showed up a few minutes later, and I insisted on playing some races from the Lightning Cup, as I could never unlock it. The day flew by, and before I knew it, I went home. I had also had Ivan help me unlock the Lightning Cup, and played Banshee Boardwalk until the music drove me into near insanity. On Friday, August 8th, my mom pulled up to the daycare, and I was thrilled to see Becca, and got to choose which candy bar I got, since we had been extra good that week. However... She turned the car back around and drove home when she saw three police cars in front of the building. And... And two men in biohazard suits walk around the back of the bright blue structure. I never saw the biohazard suits. I just saw the police cars with blue lights flashing like crazy and my mom's petrified face before pulling into a U-turn in the middle of the Harper Road, which is one of the more traveled roads in town, and flooring it back home. When we got home, she told me to go to my room and to wait there for her. I protested a bit and asked if I was in trouble. She assuaged me and said that I wasn't, as long as I went up there now and shut the door and let her make a few private phone calls. I did that while she called Riley and Carrie's mom, who had just got off the phone with Eden's mom, and was trying to get the number for Caden's mom. Five corpses had been found in the woods just behind Sunny Friends Daycare. All of them were of children who attended the daycare. One of them was Ivan. It didn't seem like some monster in the woods killed them or cult sacrificed them or anything like that. It just seemed like five random children were lured into the woods by some psychopath and bludgeoned to death with an object like a hammer. Saudi Friends was obviously shut down and left for dead. Every single employee was put under a strong microscope by the police to see if any of them could have done it. None of them were deemed the killer. My mom was able to get a week off, mostly because the financial aid office wasn't too overwhelmed at the moment so that she could find me another place to go during the week. It's about a week after this, my mom and I decided to go check out the new Dollar General that had opened up in town just south of us. Well, we happened to run into Riley and Carrie there with their dad as they had come to check it out as well. While my mom and dad were talking about the gruesome tragedy that took place at the daycare, as parents do about these things that concern their kids, Riley and I said that we should have a play date since well, we weren't going to be going back to the daycare anytime soon. Eventually, we went and talked to our parents about it, begging to hang out sometime soon. And our parents caved, probably because they knew that we were in public and they didn't want us to lose our shit. And um, they'd agreed to set up a play date. Riley and Carrie were getting babysat by Geneva Tatler, who my family knew well as she ran track with my sister, and if my dad could clear it with Geneva, then we could definitely have some quality time to play a bunch of Mario Kart. The day came where I went over to their house. I packed a bag filled with my Nintendo DS and what seemed to be a thousand different games, even though we would end up playing Mario Kart and doing the little animation program that the DS came with, and I went over with my mom. After hurriedly saying hi to Geneva and Carrie, Riley and I raced into his room and we played some video games. As we raced, I randomly took a look outside and saw a figure tucked back into the woods. It was absolutely facing the house. See, it was definitely human. Or at least, at the very least, it was some shape-shifting guy who could take human forms. I asked Riley, who's that standing in the woods? Without looking up, he said, it's probably a ghost, just ignore it. Oh, come on, man, I insisted. I know that's a human. No, you don't, he said. Billy Elkins could be putting dummies all around the woods again. Now, can we please just win this cup? Well, I want to tell Geneva, I pleaded. 
No, no, he stopped. Just think, if you tell Geneva, it could turn into something big and my parents will get involved and then I won't have any more playdates for the rest of the summer. Maybe even next. What if it's all happening over a dummy? Well, he had me convinced. All right, I said in defeat, but we better win this cup. He smiled and said, there we go. Well, we played, we got our butts handed to us. And when we finished, I saw Geneva and Carrie playing outside in a small patio. And the figure at the edge of the woods was gone. See? Riley assured me. No big deal. Nothing to worry about. Yeah, I guess you're right. Now let's go for the banana cup. I think we can win it this time. Yeah, we lost that one too. Well, after this, I went downstairs and saw Geneva and Carrie. They were happily discussing their favorite dolls. I got Riley and I some sodas from the massive new fridge his father had just gotten and ran back upstairs to play some more Mario Kart with him. After we completed the banana cup again, being only a few points away from victory and more prizes, Riley asked me a question that completely caught me off guard. He asked, Did you hear about what happened at the Sunny Friends? No. What happened? I asked nervously. See, my mother had never told me anything about why we left, or who the men in the biohazard suits were, or why a, a CSI unit was parked in the driveway. She had tried to leave it all in the past. Well... He began before peeking around to make sure that Geneva and Carrie were still downstairs. They found a bunch of dead kids behind the daycare. They were all murdered, and only a few days before it was shut down. Whoa, I paused. How do you know all this? He pointed at the wall next to us and explained that his mother constantly talked to his aunt about some of the things that went down in town, and he heard her talking about the daycare a few days before I had come over. How many died? I asked. I don't know, he informed me. I heard my mom say... Those poor kids. I can't believe that it happened, but at least it was only five and neither of my babies was one of those kids. I paused for a moment, trying to think of something to say. After a few seconds, the clearest question I could ask came to mind. Did they catch the killer? Don't know, he said. My mom changed the subject after that. They talked about something called misogyny? Then I connected some blanks that my young... Mostly innocent mind had been missing. What if the guy in the backyard was the killer? I asked frantically. What if he was coming to kill us? Dude, seriously? Riley asked, unamused. That's ridiculous. Actually, that's just stupid. Think about it. Why would he be hiding at the edge of the woods? I asked. Because there's a trail that goes over to Cressy Pond that goes behind our house? He suggested, clearly trying to change the subject. Come on, man. Can we just go back to the games? We can unlock a new character if we try. I frowned at this, but... Defeated, I opened my DS and said, Well, let's go get the ghosts. With that, we raced for the rest of the day. Around six o'clock, Carrie even came upstairs and told us dinner was ready, and my mom would be coming up to pick me up around quarter to seven. After dinner and some fun conversations with Geneva and Carrie, my mother arrived. I remember while talking to Carrie and Riley that I noticed my mother trying not to cry and handing Geneva fifty dollars, probably for taking care of me on top of the twins. On the ride home, my mom explained to me that that I was very lucky that I was able to go over to their house that day. And that it probably wouldn't happen again that summer. Naturally, I'd managed to mostly forget about the murder at the daycare. I woke up around 11 o'clock and I had to pee. <laughs> Badly. I raced out to the bathroom right next to my parents' room and I noticed my mom crying. After I went to the bathroom, I went over to go see why she was in tears, and she just shook her head. She said, it's nothing, honey, I'm just sad. Because the kids killed at the daycare, I asked? She slowly looked up at me, dumbfounded at what had just come out of my mouth. Honey, she began, how did you know about that? Riley said he heard it from his mom. She paused for a moment and wiped tears from her cheeks. Yes, honey, she said as she sniffled. I'm sorry that something so terrible happened. She paused again and looked at me before asking, Did he say anything else? I was confused, but I, I told her the truth. No. Okay, she said. Now go back to bed, please. I followed her orders. I went back to bed, even as a foolish child. I, I still knew that there was more to why my mother was crying. I was determined to figure it out. The next day, my grandfather came over to watch me. He's very good with kids, probably one of the nicest men you'd ever meet. 
He also didn't bother to hide anything from anyone. I used this to my advantage and I asked him if he knew anything about what had happened at the daycare. You mean all those kids that were murdered? He asked me. I nodded. Yeah, it was a real shame. And I wonder if the kids that the police found yesterday had anything to do with that. As awful as it sounds, I hope one child murderer is responsible. Not a, not a bunch of them. No, I was deeply unsettled. There was another murder and it was likely from the same person? It wouldn't be until school started that I found out that the boy who was murdered was Dylan Copperfield. So he was killed in the same day I was at Riley's, and his body was dumped at Cressy Lake, only about a half a mile away from Riley's house. Three days after school began, the police caught the killer. The man responsible for these six gruesome child murders was Colin Schwartz, an employee of the daycare. See, so I actually remember who he was. He often made the food for most of us, and Colin, Colin was arrested and he was quickly charged with all six murders, and he pleaded guilty to all of them. Colin's appearance did in fact match the man who I saw in the woods behind Riley's house. Town also wanted the man who owned and operated the daycare, Jason Holdsworth, held liable for the awful crimes as well. But After all, he did hire Colin. <laughs> he was thinking that he was an employee that was capable of handling children. And eventually they came to their senses. They stopped blaming Jason, or the, the rest of the town, but maybe not the families of the murdered children. Riley and Carrie managed to stay friends with me for years after that. I drifted apart from Rachel and Eden, and eventually Caden as well. But Riley, Carrie, we were all always pretty close. After graduation, we didn't talk much. Added each other on all forms of social media, like... Liked posts, saw stories and such, we rarely messaged each other. As far as I know, everyone from that group, except for Eden, disappeared at April Fool's Day. And I don't know about Caden. The last time I talked to her, I had kind of insulted her boyfriend's intelligence, and she wished to no longer speak to me. <laughs> Hell, she might not even be living in the town anymore. Or Colin Schwartz is serving six life sentences. If he hasn't already, he'll die in prison. You know, it's funny... You know, when I, when I think back, when I think back on it, I remember that Eden and I both had those vampire parasites around the same time. Both got our families very sick as well. But no one I was friends with at that point got sick. I think I know what happened in my town. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and we are back after Halloween. So, I want to give a big thank you to my Patreons. Those uh, specifically are the ones that are in the description and Joey Gilbert, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Chumpinski, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Buddy Burrows, Stephen Van House, Tristan Pelton, G Weevil 3, Asia, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Nico Keo, Caleb Dougal, Dante Rao, Last Blade Song, The Ginger Bros, Don Mewmeister, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Alex, Steampunk Sinner, The Rafael Rodriguez, Optimistic Avocado, and Dr. Strawberry. If you guys would like to join them, you can always head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. Even helping with $1 actually helps keep me alive. So a big thank you to all of you who are there from $1 all the way up to however much that you guys give. Thank you. I appreciate you guys subscribing and checking back with the channel every single day because, dear Lord help me, we are on daily uploads meaning new horror stories from me here at Mr. Creepypasta on YouTube or Mr. Creepypasta on Spotify. Sweet dreams, kids.